Um, well, Arnie, it's now game week for the Socceroos against Bangladesh, and then you're off to Kuwait for Palestine. The commencement of World Cup qualifying. Are you a bit like a kid at Christmas right about now? It's almost here. Uh, obviously, because we've gone, been through it before, you know, uh, you know where it starts. And, you know, we obviously had a bit more preparation this time in terms of being able to play against some top nations in friendlies. But, uh, yeah, look, it all starts on Thursday night against Bangladesh here at Amy Park. And, you know, the players, uh, I think, have, over the last 12 months have really shown uh, and created their own high standards. And uh, I expect those standards to be retained and, uh, through these games. Because mm. we've now had a bit of a chance to absorb the squad that was put out. And you did speak last week about it, named about how form and players playing minutes have been very important. You mentioned Milos not playing in Serbia, Aiden Rustic not playing in Italy. Um, but there are some players that aren't playing that many minutes that have retained their place. Some other players, I mean, Alex Robertson at Portsmouth, who isn't part of the squad. How exactly, I guess, because some players just get a bit more leeway in this than others because they're such important members of the squad. How do you balance that all up when it's coming around to naming it in the end? Yeah, it depends, uh, uh, Joey, which way I'm going because uh, I went for less midfielders this time to go with more strikers. Um, you know, of course, I believe this, uh, this, especially this first game, we will have the ball a lot more and uh, we'll be attacking a lot more and, and we're getting plenty of crosses in the box. So, you know, you might see a little bit of a tweak of the formation to, to uh, you know, to, to see what we're going to do with those extra players. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, Harry Soot is probably the one uh, out of them all that hasn't had as much match minutes, but uh, he's a very important cog uh, in our team, uh, down to his height, but also uh, as a leader. But, uh, you know, I think nearly every other player I've picked has, has, has come with match minutes. And as I said, it's, uh, it's very important that they do. And, but it depends, again, on the position and the structure that I want. And, uh, and it's important that they're informed for the, for the and ready for that. The name on pretty much every Australian football fan's mind at the moment is Nestor and Kunda. Kind of got thrust there again over the weekend when it was tweeted out that the deal with Bayern is effectively done, Bayern Munich. A player like him, obviously, he's so young, which we often probably forget sometimes. I mean, he's still eligible for young Socceroos and Oliroos before he even makes it to the Socceroos. I guess when you're a coach like that, people are asking, why isn't he in the team now? Just how many factors beyond just football are you considering when it comes to elevating and putting the pressure of the Socceroos shirt on somebody his age? Yeah, look, I think, uh, I think you just you said it. You know, there is also, I, I was away with him, the under-17s in Thailand. And pretty much I went there uh, to watch the 17s, the Joeys, uh, just to watch Nesta play and uh, to see where he's at. Now, <clears throat> he, hasn't, uh, he needs to start games. He needs to continually play games. He hasn't really, uh, you know, done that consistently. Um, he's a, obviously, he's an outstanding talent. But, again, there is also the under-20 national team. There's also the uh, Oli Roos that... Uh, Tony Vidmar's in charge of before the Socceroos. And I think that, uh, you know, <clears throat> I've been trying to give chances to kids to bring them in, to give them that experience. But at the same time, I do believe the junior national teams are very important. And uh, the Olympic stage, for me, is the second biggest stage that a player can get on, and uh, especially at that age. And, uh, you know, improve his worth, uh, not only there, but, uh, you know, he's uh, obviously um, going to Bay and will be a, a massive move but also a massive task uh, for a young kid 17 years of age and he'll be going to obviously a country where he won't be able to understand the language and and all that type of stuff so he'll need a lot of support along the way and uh, you know sometimes uh, it's not just about giving and and a re award a rewarding a young kid straight away he sometimes he's got to go through the right pathways mm. And I guess it's always a popular topic, the, the uh, eligibility battles and the who are they going to represent battles that have come on. Christian Volpato is the most obvious one, but there's also the likes of Noah Skoko with Croatia, Liam Chipperfield, who's also eligible for Switzerland. Mm. Do you have any updates on those players or any other players that you've been um, chasing? And Joey, that's uh, <clears throat> probably my second biggest job for this job is I'm in contact with a lot of those boys all the time. Skoko and Chipperfield... Um, Trevor Morgan and Tony Vidmar is more in contact with them because of the age, again. But uh, Valparto, I'm continually uh, communicating with and 
I've got to be honest, uh, I, I went to Italy and uh, I saw Sassuolo play against Juventus, so I caught up with him and his family after the game. And I do believe <clears throat> that the kid's at the stage where he wants to just focus on his club career. Because, uh, it, 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 you know, there's different countries take playing for Australia a different way. And a lot of countries, uh, especially with the young kids, they, uh, you know, they're not real supportive of the travel. And uh, when they get back after, you know, one or two games in the FIFA window, they get back and on the Friday they've got to play Saturday and they get left out of the squad and it takes a few weeks or even months to get back into the first team. And so at this moment in time, you know, my, uh, my sorry, my um, communication with Christian is, is he just, at this moment, he wants to focus on his club career. It's great <clears throat> to see just the other day, he played 20 minutes. So, uh, for Sassuolo and he came on again and the, uh, a couple of days ago I texted him and told him great to see that he's playing and, and that but I'm always I'm in communication a lot with these younger ones because as you said it's a it's completely different to how it used to be in the old days and I think that's where a lot of people don't understand you know it's uh, <clears throat> you know you can play 17s 20s 23s basically at a uh, play for Australia but then it you know, but then you can go and change and play for different nations. And that's what Australia, I know it's uh, about. We're a multicultural society and a lot, of, a lot of players have three or four choices on where they want to play. And, uh, but a lot of the time it gets down to what their clubs are saying to them, uh, what their parents are saying to them uh, and what their agents are saying. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, a lot of times it's one step at a time, but it, it, I'm, making, I'm making sure that I'm communicating with them and my goal is always to, to help the national team and the nation. Mm. Maybe getting out of the reeds a bit and looking at the broader perspective, obviously you're starting now your second consecutive cycle in charge of the Socceroos. Made me think back four years ago, start a World Cup qualification, you had an Asian Cup on the horizon as well. How is Graham Arnold, the Socceroos coach now, a different coach than Graham Arnold, the Socceroos coach four years ago? That's a good question, Joey. I think that uh Obviously, when you go from club football, where you have more control over what's going on on daily, weekly, monthly, um, compared to you don't really have that control at national team level. You, you know, for example, here in this camp, you know, I've only got 11 here today. Uh, tomorrow we'll have 14, 15, and then uh, on Wednesday I'll have the full uh, lineup of players to be able to train uh, for the first time. So. You know, there's certain parts that you can't control, and that is obviously the physical side, the technical side, tactical. It's more video, um, <clears throat> but you know, obviously there there've been good learnings over the last four or five years. And you know, as I said, I think that, you know times change as, as generations go on as well. And uh, I do believe that communication is the biggest key. And what I'm trying, and what I've done, and what I've been trying to do over the last four years is communicate a lot with the players whether it's picking up the telephone or texting and my physio, and we've got great relationships we've built with, uh, uh, you know, with our medical staff, with the medical staff of clubs, the sports science department, with sports science from clubs. So we're always on top of what the players or where they're at uh, health-wise. Because mm. right now, especially coming off the back of the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, it feels like the Socceroos are really riding high. There's a ton of affection for the Socceroos right now. And maybe if I look back at that journey, it feels like it, we sort of went from what was a low point after the Japan game to such the highest now. And I think back to that Japan game, obviously you got COVID, um, you got fined by the Federation. And then after that game, I remember there was a report in The Age saying that you were facing the axe that was citing anonymous figures. Did you write that? No, somebody else <laughs> called Lynch did. Um, but uh, that, so that arguably felt like the low point. But ever since then, it feels like it's just been on an upwards trajectory. And it even feels like you as a coach, you maybe switched a few things up on the field and also your approach. What, what do you reflect on that time and how did it change your approach Look, if I, it did? Joey, it was probably one of the toughest periods you could go through with COVID. And, uh, you know, the players were stressed to the eyeballs with just having to, to get to Australia, travel. The travel was a nightmare when, they, when we actually could come back to Australia the pressure they were getting from their clubs to not come uh, because if they did come and went back with COVID, basically they're out of the squad for months on end. 
<clears throat> and also mentally tough for myself and, and the staff because, uh, you know, as I said, it was uh, a, a period where, you know, we played so many games away from home. Players never got to come and see their families. And, and you can imagine, you know, coming back when COVID, when we were allowed to come back to play back in Australia, uh, OK, boys, you come back now. We're, we're allowed to play in Australia, but you can't see your families. You can't see your friends, right? Because if we do and they've got COVID or, they'll, or they... And then we tried to do a, a case where they, we tested the players' parents and everything before they come in. And no one likes to see that. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very difficult period mentally um, for us overall. And, you know, as, as you said, the Japan game, you know, when it was on the edge and, uh, you know, I had COVID. I, as you said, I got fined for walking a dog that I didn't, I didn't do. Um, <clears throat> and... You know, so, but I just, I've learnt probably the hard way to not listen to, you know, people's voices. It's, uh, you know, I'm set in my own ways and focusing on just the players and, and what's right for the players and, and then you get that type of results. And uh, I think that overall, it's, you know, going through that COVID thing was a great lesson for everyone to learn and, uh, you know, and uh, for the young players and again, you know, Doing the Olympic team was uh, something that probably everyone looked at that I was crazy to do because it was um, it's extra responsibility, it's extra extra pressure. But you know, I just didn't know where I was getting the players from because uh, you know it was an old squad at the 2018 World Cup, and you know, and a lot of players were going to retire. And I have to say, Joey, I'm going through a little bit at the same same stage now. And it's a bit of a pity that <clears throat> this Asian Cup. It's going to be in January, where it should have been in June last year, or in 2023, in China. And, uh, you know, and we're going to push on with these older players and push them as far as they can go. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's down to what they're doing at their clubs. It feels like, even if it wasn't at the start when you first took on that Ali Roos job, by the end of it, the Paris Olympics, it felt like that was almost your biggest passion in Australian football. It's not so much the Socceroos, but hearing you talk about the Ollie Roos and bringing this generation through, who, let's face it, a lot of people wrote off that younger generation. They were crap. They weren't as good as previous ones. Did, did that become your passion project for a while? And did it change who you are as a coach, getting to see these youngsters coming through? Yeah, but like, <clears throat> you're only as good as the ingredients. The soccer is, and it's the same with the Matildas. It's the same, and I don't want to talk about other sports, but it's the same as the Wallabies in rugby. It's the same as, you know, uh, national teams, sport. If you don't have good pathways, if you don't have the right, uh, uh, you know, right pathways for the kids to go down, and I truly believe if you look at the golden generation, you look back from even when I played 1988, the Olympics, it was over age and when it dropped back to 92 to under 23s and everyone wants to talk about the golden generation where did they come from they come from the olympic programs and, and that for me it's the most important program there is outside of obviously the soccer is for the world cup mm -hmm. because if the statistics and i've looked at all the data and all the statistics a successful olympic campaign is just qualification out of an olympic campaign you normally, uh, with, with qualification, you normally get close to 10 players every four years from the Olympics. So there is, if you have a three-year campaign for the players, that's 30 players you're getting in a World Cup cycle. If the kid goes from age 21 through to 32, 33, he's getting three, uh, you're getting three cycles, which obviously then gives you a lot more players and talent. And if you look at the soccer squad, Today, and the one that I took to the World Cup, it was predominantly from that 2022 Tokyo Olympic squad. Mm -hmm. You touched before about how in these games against Bangladesh, you're going to have a lot of possession and that's going to affect your approach. And you look back on the, the last cycle, that was one of the challenges for this side. Um, coming up against these really high-powered opposition in the World Cup, playing well, playing on the counter, when the Socceroos needed to break down a parked bus, for lack of a better word, on dodgy pitches, parked buses, 11 men behind the ball, soccer is needing to break that down. That was one of the challenges. Heading into a new cycle, well, you know you're going to face that again. Um, first and second phase of qualifying. How is your approach adjusted to account for that? And is it a matter of better players or do you adjust your how you go about your build-up play? What are you thinking? 
Yeah, but look, I think that, uh, again, the boys have created their own standards and shown everyone in Australia and around the world, and we get more respect in Europe for what we've done than what we do here in Australia. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you play against these type of uh, nations, and then it's all down to the technical skill and, the, and, the, and that side of it. And I call it, in a lot of ways, backyard football time because you've got to show what your qualities are with the ball. Of course, we've got the qualities of, uh, you know, the physical aspect of it and running, chasing and fighting and the Aussie DNA. But this one and these type of games are more about, OK, show your, show your skills, show what we can do. And, and the training sessions will be based around attack and the, and the cues on, on, you know, crossing or delivering and what areas to do that from and, and making sure we're getting men in the box ready to score. Mm -hmm. The last cycle, a lot of the punditry, there was a lot of talk about cattle, about how you didn't have the cattle, about how people freely throwing around, which I thought was crap, but freely throwing around, this is the worst Socceroos side in decades. Mm. Won't get into the analysis of that, but heading into this one, do you feel you've got the cattle to accomplish something great? Well, uh, Joey, yeah, look, I, I'll be honest. If I didn't think that we were moving forward, I would have left. And... Uh, you know, after what we achieved at the World Cup, I had so many people saying to me, Arnie, get out now while you're on top. It's the best time to get out is after you created something special. But uh, I do believe in Australian kids and, and, and Australian football. Um, it gets frustrating for me at times, especially, you know, the A-League uh, with, with their starting of their season and taking away the opportunity for players to, to play for their nation. But... I do believe, again, that uh, with this younger generation coming through and with the blend of the senior boys, and they are crucial in, in, in with their leadership, but also with their experiences when you play away from home in those type of nations, um, that uh, we can do things better. And uh, as I said, they've set their own standards and it's now about uh, you know doing better than those standards and, and, and going on and achieving something even more special. Mm. A lot of the time, head coaches and national teams are seen as um, apostles for the sport just as much as they are coaches, and that's something that you seem to have embraced. You're, you'll go into battle. You called out Anthony Albanese during the last window for losing his soccer roost staff. When you look out at the progress of Australian football across the entire spectrum, the A-League, pathways, everything, what do you think of the direction? Do you think we're on the right trajectory? What do you think should be the priorities? Joey, I think uh, a lot more needs to be done. You know, we can sit here and we can talk about how well the Matildas did at the World Cup, Women's World Cup, how well we did in Qatar, but it all starts at the bottom. And uh, unless <clears throat> there's a lot of hard work and connect, uh, and in my view, uh, connectivity but, uh, with the state federations, with the FA, and we all work together and we're all on one sheet of paper, you know, and for the good of the game and for the kids, then... Who knows? It, uh, because it, it, can, it can get wor uh, better, but it also can get worse, and there's a lot of hard work to be done on that. Because mm. we are getting an NSD, so, a national second tier, I should say, keep mm. Football Australia happy. Getting a national second tier coming in soon. You talk about connectivity, and I remember speaking to some of the boys that moved to Europe, they talk about the threat of relegation yep. and the intensity that that leads in. Obviously, all that boring stuff around finances is, is a, something I've batted as well, but... Would you like to see Australia moving towards one day having a united pyramid? Yes, 100%, because it's uh, like anything. You only can move forward and, and that with a health, healthy culture and, and working under a healthy pyramid. What we don't want is, and where it's probably been for a long time, is we have you know, the state federations, the A-League and the NFA, instead of everyone on top of each other and, and working together uh, for the good of the game. But... Uh, you know, it's 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 just so important for the for the kids in the game. And look, yes, we're a multi-cultural uh, uh, sporting nation, obviously, with uh, you know AFL and rugby league and rugby union and cricket and that. But at the end of the day, I think football is still number one in this nation uh, at grassroots. We have, there's more kids that are playing, and with I'm just saying, with uh, what's happening with these other big sports with concussion and all that there's a uh, you know uh, I've, I do believe and I have heard and seen that you know parents now are, want, are encouraging their kids more to go and play football and at a younger age which uh, they're driving them down the right direction that way and and again but uh, we need to have the the right 
uh, the right model in place. And I just think, Joey, at the end of the day, it's quite simple. It's more football. Instead of just being five months of the year, you know, it should be, it's like Europe. The biggest difference with, with football here in Australia and South America and Europe is in Europe and South America, it's done for 10 months. For, for football here, it's done for five. And you, it's like uh, at the end of the day, yes, it's a team sport, but it's an individual sport as well. And, you know, it's, it's all about uh, how does someone get better? And, and, you know, these kids from the Olympic team, as I said, they've shown. They've gone to Scotland. Okay, people might say, well, the Scottish League's not the best in the world, but hey, they're playing 50 odd games a year now, 60, or 60 games a year. So straight away, physically, their, their bodies are different, much stronger, better athletes. Technically, because they're doing it more, technically, they're much better. And tactics, well, okay, everyone has a game plan and, and a way to play. And mentally, they believe in themselves much more. And I guess last one, because I'm getting the wrap up signal, so I'll uh, ask the last one. But obviously, Hibs came for you, you turned them down. Um, I remember seeing reports in England when jobs are opening up, your name begins to get raised with that. You've become a hot property, Lakeep, certainly big fan, naming you best coach at the World Cup. Am I still going to be annoying you about the Socceroos <laughs> in four years' time? Are you going to stick out the cycle? What sort of offer would it take to get you away? Something special, I'll be honest. It would have to be something special, Joey. It's, uh, you know, this badge on my heart, the, the Aussie badge is always... Not Subway. No, not Subway. <laughs> uh, the Aussie badge <laughs> is, is always uh, something that's uh, very unique and special. And, you know, from even <clears throat> from the first time I played for the Socceroos in the mid-80s till today, every time I walk on the pitch with that on, you know, it's, it's, it's something unique and special. And as I said, it would have to be something special for me to leave. Uh, uh, leave the job and go back to club football but uh, you know as I said I'm just here to help if I can I'm here to help the nation and help Australian kids fulfill their dreams and and uh, put a smile on uh, all Australian faces. Seems like a pretty good way to end it.